Hi, my name is Matt Wynn. I'm from the Cucumber Project. I first started using BDD in 2007. A few years later, I published The Cucumber Book together with my colleague, Aslak Helisoy. And after that, I started to work as a consultant teaching teams and organizations all over the world how to apply these practices. And in this short series of webinars, I'm going to be sharing some of that experience with you. In this first one, we're going to start with the real fundamentals. Who is it for? What is it even? Why would people use it? Where does it happen and when? Well, BDD is for agile software development teams. Now that word agile has come to mean lots of different things to different people over the years. So let's be specific about what we mean here. For one thing, we imagine that you're a cross-functional team. That is, you've got people who understand the business problems, people who uh, understand the software development, and also people who are thinking about how to break that software, the people who can see edge cases and look for ways to, to really find the, the corner cases. We also assume that you're planning your work in vertically sliced user stories. So rather than planning, say, a change to the database as, as a user story, you're going to plan a um, change that includes something to the user interface, any layers that bridge between there and the back end, and then changes to the back end itself. So everything you need in one package to make some kind of user-facing behavior change. We also assume you're working in short iterations. So those slices are hopefully nice and thin, only adding a small increment of behavior at a time. And once you ship those changes in front of users, you got to listen to them, get their feedback and repeat. We also assume that you are automating your tests. So it's fine to be doing some manual exploratory testing as well, but we would assume that the team is already capable of and happy with writing software that tests the production code and generally doing that as they do the development work, if not using test-driven development practices to actually drive out the development as they go from tests. So what is BDD? Well, BDD is a technique for agile software development teams that uses concrete examples expressed in plain language to create shared understanding of the problem to be solved and then drive out that solution with automated tests. So we use this process of distilling the problem down into concrete examples to create shared understanding between the people working on the project. But then we express those examples in a way that the computer is going to be able to understand them and run them as automated tests. And this is really the power of BDD. So in terms of benefits, what we see teams enjoying is for starters, they'll see a shorter cycle time from idea to shipped and working in production. How do we get that? Well, one of the key ways is that the team are going to make less mistakes. They're going to do a little bit more work up front, just a little bit to talk about and express as examples the behavior that they want from the system when the story's done. And as they do that, a lot of the time, what they'll be doing is actually shaving out, shedding off behavior that isn't really needed for this user story and might otherwise have got built if that conversation hadn't happened. So we have a shorter cycle time and because we've increased the shared understanding, we're gonna more likely build the right code first time. So we're gonna have less production defects. What we end up with is this living document because we have used plain language to describe the behavior of the system, but that, those plain language scenarios also work as automated tests. So now we've actually got this document that anyone on the team could read that's regularly validated. Like a, uh, every time you run your continuous integration CI tests, you're validating that documentation. Now, I've seen time and time again that overall this practice leads to teams that are happier. They're more cohesive. Teams talk to us about having um, greater empathy for one another because we're really working together to try and understand and deal with all of that kind of uncertainty that we often tackle late on in a software project. We're, we're proactively working to try and uncover it. And then if we miss things later on, well, it's kind of nobody's fault. You know, we all try our best. BDD tends to happen most, I've seen, 
in um, industries where that understanding between the people with the money and the problems and the people with the technical know-how, um, where that understanding is really business critical. So, for example, that might be regulated industries like finance and pharmaceuticals, also ones with kind of complicated business rules like insurance companies, where it's really important to have non-technical people involved in understanding the details of the logic that's being implemented in the code. We also tend to see BDD used in terms of the, the array of various tools that are out there for doing software testing. Um, we see it involved kind of on um, individual scenarios of, of um, a change of state of a system. So rather than big kind of workflow, big end-to-end -end tests, um, we, we tend to see it used more uh, in, in sort of fine-grained scenario testing. In terms of where it fits into the software life cycle, well, really you're going to see BDD being used before, during, and after some code gets written for each user story. So we're always in this sort of iterative cycle. We start with what we call discovery, where we proactively look to try and understand the scope of the story in terms of the examples. Then once we do understand those examples, we're going to start to use formulation to express them in a way that they can be understood, not just by people, but also by um the, the, the computer, like say a tool like Cucumber or Wreck and Roll, so that you can actually automate the scenarios as tests. Then once you've done that, we can start to automate them and use them to drive out the solution. Let's talk about some specific examples of who's using BDD and some clients that I worked with in the past in my consulting career. The used uh, BDD to help them to build out their sport app. Um, and now this is a smart TV app. So this was going to go and, and be deployed onto about 50 different brands of TV. And you might not know, but smart TVs run um, a kind of web browser that runs a kind of JavaScript. Um, they're usually quite quirky and they have um, older versions of JavaScript. So different things are supported um, or not. And across those 50 different TVs, we had quite a lot of quirks to deal with. Also, um, a couple of the platforms they were deploying to were set-top boxes that didn't even run JavaScript. They ran a flavor of action script, in fact, which you might remember from Flash. Anyway, so they had this behavior for this app. They wanted a standardized experience across all of the, the different TVs, but they were going to have to um, implement it slightly differently or really differently depending on the platform. So what they did was they used Gherkin and BDD to describe the behavior of the app and then they use different automation connections for the different devices to help them to run the same scenarios on each of the different TVs. And that enabled them to see at a product level what behaviors were supported on each of the devices. And occasionally they'd have a device where something wasn't possible. Perhaps it didn't, it didn't support a swipe action, for example. And, and those scenarios would be marked out to say that they weren't supported on that particular TV or when they ran them on their continuous integration platform. Um, and it was really amazing to see, like they had this rack of TVs on the wall and they were running the tests and you could see all the TVs flashing around the different um, pages of the app. When those tests ran, sometimes one of the scenarios would fail. And again, like at this holistic level, you could see, okay, this scenario is broken on that particular device. So really, really helpful for them to get this kind of consistent behavior across different technology platforms where they wanted their um, their app application to be deployed. Another story from the same organization was the, the weather team. And the weather team had embraced BDD for their uh, desktop uh, HTML app. So they, they, were, um, they were already using it for describing changes and, and driving out changes to the, the, the standard uh, desktop browser app. But then they wanted to build a mobile app. And the team took a brave decision because a lot of teams in this position where they don't know uh, the technology will just hire in like outside contractors or even an agency to build their app for them. This team actually decided that they were going to learn Objective-C and build it themselves. They were the domain experts on the problem space. They just needed to know the technology. And because they were so familiar with BDD, they used um, Gherkin scenarios to describe the behavior of the new app, of the new mobile app. And what this gave them was a kind of a framework for um, guide, guide rails 
for building out the new app. So they didn't have to uh, worry about so many things as they were learning this new programming language. So they were all learning Objective-C together, but they did at least know, you know, what's the app supposed to do. And they had these really clear set of tests that they, all they had to do was make that test pass and everything would be good. And it really, really helped them as a team um, to have that structure and, you know, enabled them to, to add a new programming language to their resumes as well. Really, really excellent work from that team, I think. Another example is an insurance company I worked with many years ago now, and they were tasked with moving um, this really core, complex business logic from a old kind of 70s, 80s code base on a, running on a mainframe to a more modern Java stack. And the one snag with this was that the last person in the building who understood that old system and knew how it worked and understood the business rules was about to retire in six months. And once they left, all of the domain knowledge about that system was going to be gone and they were going to be forced to just, you know, reverse engineer and figure out how it behaved by reading the code. So we had a really intense six months with this last domain expert and um, spending lots of time in a room with them. And most of what we were doing was distilling down their knowledge into um, BDD examples that the team would then take to develop the, the new Java implementation. And BDD was just such a great tool for them to capture the essence of the, the most complicated business rules and, and all of the stuff that was in this person's head. And they could then use that as a specification for them to build the new system. Finally, the company where I learned BDD um, back in the late 2000s, we built uh, an app for uh, live music fans. And on the app, we developed this capability to offer a activity feed. So when you were looking at your activity feed, you would see um, messages about a friend has bought a ticket for this concert or this band that you follow has announced uh, a tour or this venue that you follow has announced um, a new concert. And so there were quite a lot of complicated rules about what should appear on your feed and when. And we spent about three months developing this, this functionality, using BDD to drive out every, uh, every new behavior. And as we got towards shipping into production, we realized that we'd made some fundamental mistakes with the architecture. The way it was implemented was a bit naive and basically it wasn't going to perform. So if a big band like Radiohead announced a concert and you know, hundreds of thousands of fans needed to be notified, it was going to suck all the life out of the servers, really drain the uh, the performance. So we needed a different model, a different way of, uh, of implementing it, but the behavior still needed to be the same. And essentially we scrapped the old implementation and started, started again. This time though, it took us less than four weeks to completely implement the behavior from scratch because we kept the tests. We still had the set of scenarios that we'd been growing through that three month period as we'd evolved our understanding of what we wanted the system to do in the different situations. And now we had the answer. All we had to do was um, produce the code that would satisfy those tests and we were done. So again, like really, really helpful to have that guideline there. So in summary, who's BDD4 is for agile software development teams. What is it? Well, we'll use concrete examples to create shared understanding and then drive out a solution using automated tests. Why would you use it? You're going to see benefits like increased uh, uh, shorter cycle times, fewer defects, happier teams, and living documentation. Who uses BDD? We tend to see it used in industries most where there's um, a really business critical need for common understanding. And when we see it used right throughout the software development life cycle from before the code gets written right to afterwards when we want that living documentation. I hope that's helped you get a general sense of what BDD is about and piqued your interest for listening to the rest of these webinars. If you want to find out more today, you can go to cucumber.io slash docs slash BDD. And in the next session, we're going to be zooming into that discovery piece. And we're going to talk about the power of examples. See you next time.